Washington University is really a uniquely collaborative environment. None of us can do what we do by ourselves. We need a team for everything we do. And it is this collaborative effort between the scientist and the clinician that makes this place great and different than other institutions. There's no surgeon that goes through the training that we go through that doesn't do it because they want to look after patients and want to do a good job. And when they're looking at that patient in the eye and seeing their family, they want to do the best they possibly can. The best surgeons are the ones who are constantly questioning the disease process uh, and even prevention. From where I sit, the integration of everything from cell biology to population outcomes fosters all of this collaborative research in the context of great clinical care. We think about the community as a patient, so what can we do to make communities broadly more healthy? Everything that we do is for one person, that's the patient. We can never forget that and always give our best to that person. So Fred Murphy was the uh, first uh, official chief of surgery at Washington University. And he came in as a result of some tumultuous changes brought on by the Flexner Report. One of Flexner's uh, conclusions was that we really needed to have academic, ultimately full-time medical education. Dr. Murphy, in 1914, performed the first operation in the Department of Surgery at Washington University. Uh, it was an appendectomy. He went on, as trouble was brewing in Europe, uh, to put together a Washington University surgical unit which uh, ultimately went to France and served during the First World War. The problem was he didn't come back. So we were without a chief of surgery at Washington University uh, for a while. And during the interim period, Ernest Sachs uh, stood in as the interim chief of surgery at Washington University until ultimately uh, we could recruit and bring in Evarts Graham. Of all of the individuals who have been chairs of surgery throughout the country, Evarts Graham is probably one of the most impactful. He was held in such total respect that when he walked down the hall with his residents, there was a sense of awe. <laughs> you didn't really just run up and talk to him. You, you have to be up in the echelon uh, a little bit to feel comfortable. He was the first person to remove a cancerous lung. He developed the method for visualizing the biliary tract, gallbladder. He formed the American Board of Surgery, which is uh, the, you know, the institution of certification of surgery in the, in the United States and in the world. Uh, and the American Board of Surgery, uh, the diploma number one was Evers Graham. He was very proud of that contribution that he organized surgery as an ethical group. Dr. Glover Kofer. Glover was a total perfectionist, and he made you be as close to perfect as you could. James Barrett Brown, he went um, in the Second World War and um, looked after the um, war casualties. That's where a lot of plastic surgery develops. It's crazy injuries, and when there's a war, there's crazy injuries, and a lot of them. Dr. Winder was a second year medical student during the pathology rotation. And he discovered the link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. In several ways, Dr. Moyer was a very impressive man. He was tall, very athletic looking, rugged, craggy, he had a wonderful twinkle in his eye, always questioning, everything was a question. When I was an intern, Dr. Moy was the professor of surgery, and his area of expertise was what? Fluid balance. And I found it, when I was coming to talk to you today, I found it some 60 years old. But oh, he was a great teacher. One of the things that was very important to him was Homer Phillips Hospital. 
You want to become the best surgeon you could become. So you want to learn what you could from the people who were at Homer Phillips Hospital, the doctors, the surgeons who came from Barnes over to Homer Phillips. We learned a lot from them. It was a wonderful relationship that existed between Homer Phillips and Washington University. Very few people other than Harvey Butcher you would want helping you, if, particularly if you're in a tough time. So he was known as our fireman. If any physician in this institution would get into a pickle in the operating room, the first name that they would say is called Harvey. Dr. Turnberg, Dr. Jessie Turnberg, was the first woman uh, surgery resident. It was not considered to be a woman's field, and that's another reason why everybody admired Jessie for, for you know, doing what she did. I had been so excited about being accepted for this program. And I was just eager. I got here, I found where they were signing in, and I went there, and the guy looked at me, and he said, oh, no, no, you've made a terrible mistake. We don't have any women in the surgery. Uh, why don't you look at your list there? Is there a Jesse Turnper? And he got this horrible look on his face. He said, oh yeah, my God. <laughs> well, when I trained here, Jesse was already an icon in surgery. And here you were, a young pup, feeling like you could really show the professor that you had more stamina and there was no way you could keep up with Jesse Thurmberg. Hands of a lady and the heart of a lion. Walter Ballinger was a dear friend, and I, I choke up a bit when I, I speak about this man because more than any other person, more than any other person, he's responsible for introducing me to the high levels of academic surgery. Walter was the consummate academic surgeon of the time. In fact, he was actually among the first in the world to ever do islet cell transplantation. Transplantation became a clinical reality in the 70s. So it was undoubtedly a field that became a, an important field where there were a lot of advances that were being made to improve the outcomes. We had some uh, very bright, innovative people here. Well, Dr. Bricker was one of them. His hand movements were just uh, exquisite. It was just like seeing a, a real artist doing his work. Dr. Ballinger's strengths, his major strength, was his support of his staff, faculty, and support of the residents so that they could become better. All of my friends nationally felt that the Department of Surgery that Sam Wells built was one of the best in the country. Some argued that he might have built the most academically accomplished department of surgery in the United States. I recruited 70, 80 faculty members when I was here. These were people who already had uh, national reputations. We came to work in Sam Wells' department. We're here because we want to work with brilliant medical students and in incredible residents and fellows and, and uh, a group of people and love what they do. I'll say it again, most of the success of the department was due to these people. There were two separate training programs in surgery, one at Barnes Hospital uh, and the other at Jewish. Both were affiliated with Washington University. The board made the decision, it was extremely difficult. So we combined the residency program, the hospitals, we kept the name Barnes Jewish. The merger was in some ways traumatic, but here you look now uh, 20 years later and you say, gee, the department is much stronger because of the heritage of both components of the organization, Sam Wells. And he finally made it across the finish line and created a full-time academic model. I thought, now what can he add to this place? 
uh, that Dr. Wells had not accomplished. And I can say that he did. Tim has the, the personality to do what's right, to be fair, and to work across departmental lines. We've got a vibrant research program that's almost unmatched in the country. In terms of funding, we're leaders in many different aspects of surgery. Cardiac surgeons are doing minimally invasive operations, you know, replacing valves without really making any incision. We're doing, you know, robotic surgery. There's been a complete transformation. Tim, he believes in diversity. He believes in women in surgery, and he believes in people from other races to be part of the, uh, of the faculty. It's been wonderful to bring public health and the Department of Surgery together in looking at outcomes, in studying patient populations. We are really focused on trying to develop solutions and interventions and develop new models and new ways of thinking, develop new ways of collecting and capturing data that we're gonna be able to use later. One of our strengths can really be this translation to impacting the community, working with the community to address the access and uh, outcomes issues. You can see with the surgical residents coming through that there's passion among the, our future. I think we're a powerhouse here in the Midwest, and, and we're, I mean, we're young, so we're definitely a force to be reckoned with. One of the greatest challenges that we face is changing the paradigm of education. Through Mary Klingensmith and Mike Awad and Mike Brunt and many of our faculty, we've introduced the academy model, different programs and simulation and virtual training, and then flexibility in training. If we really change the paradigm, I think in the next hundred years, we'll train surgeons who are even better than those of us who came before. All you have to do is rest on the shoulders of the giants.